Hey, future bestsellers, Lisa Daly here. So how do you build and grow your author newsletter list? Well, if you wanna find out, you need to stay tuned because I am talking with the newsletter ninja herself. Thanks so much for being here today. If you wanna write a book you are super proud of and get it published, this is the channel for you. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button and ding that little bell because I'm gonna be posting a lot of great videos to help you do just that. And I don't want you to miss a thing. Here's part two of my interview with a newsletter ninja herself, Tammy LeBret. I wanna transition here into talking about and this is another question I'm sure you get all the time. And that is, how do I build a list? And I think that that is such a perfect thing to talk about because it really just dovetails into a lot of what Newsletter Ninja 2 is about, which is this idea of giving your reader a cookie or a newsletter magnet, people, um, you know, something that entices people onto your newsletter list and makes them want to stay for all the magical things that you're going to be sending their way. Magical things. So yes, um, super into reader magnets right now, obviously. Um, talking about them a lot. <coughs> I, <laughs> I, I will say I too am super into reader magnets and because, because, and I have really struggled because I have, you know, I, I did marketing for a publishing house for a long time. I was director of publicity for a long time. And I, and you know how it is like the plumber's house is always like the leaky one. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. And so I have like, I don't produce books as quickly as other people do. And so, and I hadn't really, and I've never really been a short story writer. So I'm kind of like, eh, what am I going to do with this? And after, and you should know, I've been waiting for newsletter Ninja two for pretty much since you announced it. And I was so crushed on the two because it came out on a Wednesday and, you know, books almost always come out on Tuesday. And I was all excited, like dates be damned. I was all excited, like it's here and I open up and it's not my Kindle. I'm like, okay, what is happening? And I go and I'm a day, I'm a day early. I was so excited. I get it that next day. I read it in the bathtub and I'm literally making notes on my phone that night about oh oh my gosh so excited first of all you had so many great examples in there of reader magnets that were really different a lot of different ones and it just so happens which i think i mentioned to you before um before we went live is that i have a re-release of 15 minutes of shame which was my first novel ever and it is i think you know the one certainly was the one i loved the most for a very long time it's tied now with single-minded which you can see on the back wall there and but i always really struggled with should i, should I do this and, and it's written in single point of view and one thing i know is that a lot of my readers enjoy books that are dual point of view and I thought, I am going to write a chapter from Holt's point of view. And I did that because of you. Like, yay! And I literally slid it in under the wire in the ebook, like, click here to read this chapter from Holt's point of view. So thank you for that. But you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. So let's talk about what how to build a list using reader magnets why they're important what they do besides get people onto your list and all of the goodies that were that we're going to find in newsletter ninja 2. so the genesis of this um comes from me seeing a lot of people giving away reader you know i've got this reader magnet and then they would tell me what it is and i would go like "Ooh, mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> like yikes um, and it's not helpful to say, that doesn't sound like a very good reader magnet to me. And then they would say, first of all, I would never say that because I'm very shy. But um, if I did get up the gumption to say it, obviously the next thing they say is, what do you think I should do? And I would be like, I don't know. So I figured I'd better look into it and try to figure it out. Um, what I realized was that a lot of people were giving away, they were doing a few things that were very not the right thing to do. Um, the first thing is there is some, some old advice that worked, I'm sure in 2015, although I don't know, cause I wasn't publishing enough books then, um, 
to make your first book perma free and give away your book to as a as a sign up bonus, um, which is dreadful advice now, only because of the way that Amazon's algorithms work. It's right. just I explain it all in the book, but it's terrible. Basically, there's no sell through from book one to book two, and your series is dead in the water. Amazon goes, eh, no one buys book two. Yeah, because I gave them everything for free. Right. It sounds like a good idea, but then oh no. Um, so that's not a great plan. Um, also, with the advent of Kindle Unlimited, um, there are a lot of people who going perma free with their first book isn't really going to help them because Kindle Unlimited and the paid store, which is where those free books live, don't connect a lot. Kindle right. Unlimited people get Kindle Unlimited recommendations, so Amazon's not going to show them your book one. So that's there's a whole chatter, chapter on strategy versus tactics. It's very long, and I talk about like traffic lights. I don't know, man. I almost pulled the whole chapter. No, it was very, it was very helpful. I know. And then someone emailed me and was like, "This chapter changed my life." And I was like, "Okay, good. I'm glad I left it." In. Yeah. But when I was done, I was like, "These people are gonna help return their book. They don't care about traffic circles." No, I first oh. of all, I love, <laughs> I love traffic circles. <laughs> Traffic circles save lives. They do. They're my, they're and book awesome. series, too, right? And book series too. Okay. So, yeah. So I thought that was very helpful because it was a very practical explanation for why that strategy doesn't work Thank anymore. You. That does my heart good. It, really it was. Does. It was very because. And the thing is, is you never really know until someone comes along with some data. And and this is one thing I really love about you and about Becca Sun because she had right she she I know she comes with the numbers and and I really like that about her because that's the thing is like I don't I don't want to I don't care what everybody's opinion is I want to know what works I want to know the facts are and I want to know that what I'm doing is going to have some practical impact on my book sales. So let's talk first about building lists. How do you do you have, so let's say you want to start building a mailing list and maybe you've got your first book out, but maybe you have not published your first book yet. So how do you start there? Okay. Let's start with you haven't published your first book. Okay. You got nothing. Um, conventional wisdom would say, well, maybe I should wait till the first book's out and then I'll write a cookie or, you know, I'll write them simultaneously. And then when the first book comes out, it'll have the offer for the cookie in the back. Um, one thing that I've actually seen people do very, very successfully is to get the cookie out there first, which sounds crazy. But if you've written what I call a convertible cookie, right, that right. can appeal to existing readers, but also pull strangers New into the catalog. Um, and that's a, there's a whole method, you know, you have to like think about a bunch of things, but if you can write one of those, which is not that hard, um, you can get that out ahead of the series and have a little bit of a list to launch to, which is pretty sweet. Um, if you know somebody who writes in your genre and you can get them to maybe share it with their list, um, at that point, it's really, you got to ask somebody, you know, who likes you because you have right. nothing to offer. <laughs> but I, have four, like, no. I have 14 people. <laughs> They're all related to me. Well, like, yeah, I, no. I know. Well, <laughs> so you so when I do your newsletter list, swaps, I'll be... and I'll send yeah. you my list and they'll go, okay, that's great. Right. I can't wait to, for your mom yeah. to sign up. So, <laughs> so, but if you know somebody that would do you that kind of favor, a signal boost from another author is super helpful. If that author's list is 500 people, it's 500 more than you've got. So right. do it up. Um, right. You can also, though, go and do um, swaps on, like, say, Book Funnel or Story Origins. I actually don't use Story Origins, uh, which is not a me saying don't use it. It's just like I have time to learn something new. Right. Um, I, I, use, I use Story Origins. Yeah. I have both, and I, I use Story Origins more than I use Book Funnel. And I, re I like them both. Uh, I feel like I use Story Origins more often because it helps me keep track of things better than Book Funnel does, which does not seem like it would be possible because Book Funnel does a fine job of that. But I really like the setup for Story Origins and it real and um, and it make it does make it easy. So I think either one is probably a, a good bet. And I will say for good karma, I always will try to pick people like. I generally, obviously, want to swap with people that have books that are really similar to to yours. But one of the things that I do is like just for extra good karma, I always pick somebody who has a book that's similar to mine, but with a small list. I love you. Oh, thank you so much. So, I do. Um, I I do. Uh, I have a lot of client services. A lot of people whose mailing lists I manage. Um, I don't host anyone's mailing list anymore. I don't think. 
but I do have a lot of people that I'm an admin on their accounts mm -hmm. on, you know, active campaign or mail or like, and I manage their mailing list. And for some of those people, I do promotions. And when I'm in charge of curating a promotion, that is truly like if someone has 50,000 and then this person has 5,000, there's the point isn't necessarily to, first of all, when you've got the 50,000 or the 80,000 people, there, there aren't that many. <laughs> You're only going to go with people who are the si same size as you. That's not going to work out. And most of them are going to overlap. Um, but it's not even just about that. It's about giving your people something fresh. When you do a newsletter swap, right. you get the benefit of some signups, but you've also got this new cookie from some author they don't know that right. you get to put in front of them. And that feels like a gift to them. They look at that and they go, well, she's not getting anything out of it. And she's not because it's free. This is great. And then they feel good about that. So I always try to include some of the smaller people and some of the bigger people. And I've never had anyone complain yet. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like you're getting bad signups from someone with a tiny list. It's tiny. No. Right. So I definitely, I love that. And I love the idea of thinking of it as just like, you know, good person points. That's good. Um, Cause there's no point. There's no point in pulling the ladder up behind you people. Let me tell no. you any of this. We're all yeah. in this together. So um, how should you build your list? So do that reach out to people say you know will you put my my um reader magnet in front of your people you can in general with any kind of cross promotion advertisement favor that you're asking i always sort of in my head imagine it as like you can reach up like one level and then you really can't go too much higher than that because what do you have to offer right. however i will sometimes reach a little higher usually on someone else's behalf not mine which is fine <laughs> um but i will sometimes reach a little higher and if I do that, if I reach out to somebody whose list is big enough and I'm like, eh, I will say to them, would you share this cookie with them? It doesn't require an email sign up. Then they're just straight up giving something, but you're not like siphoning their whole list to you, which can right. be gross to them. Right. And if you really nail the CTA at the back of that cookie, the people who do download it and the people who actually read it to the end, if they enjoyed it, will then sign up voluntarily. You get a right. smaller number of people, but they're generally better people and you were able to access something that might not have otherwise been available. If I want to do a story origins or a book funnel um, bundle with folks and somebody's list doesn't look so great, I'll mm -hmm. often offer to run Facebook ads to the promotion. So, cause I'm fairly good at Facebook ad targeting. You obviously don't want to, you're going to do this tightly targeted promotion that just advertise it to everyone, but I'll offer to run Facebook ads, like say to, I have a romance group, like a group that's not affiliated with an author name. Mm -hmm. I'll say, I'll run this to my, to this author page, this um, sexy romance page that I run. I'll run ads to that audience or whatever. Um, and that actually, people will be happy about that. You spend a little bit of money on it, but it's less than you'd spend on a book club, you know? Right, um, right. So that works pretty well. If you So if you're just, you don't have much, um, you can get your cookie out there ahead of time and build yourself a little list to launch to. I would rather launch to 50 people than no people. Like yeah. any, day, any day. In fact, if I had a list of 50 people, I'd probably segment my launch emails, which is a hilarious thing to say about 50 people, but, and send it to, you know, I don't know, send it over three or four days. Um, so the Amazon sees like a little kind of, just a little trend. Oh, look, that book's doing okay oh, down there in the telephone numbers. <laughs> like, you just <laughs> always kind of want to be, you know, trending Maybe up for them. So sending, I some, probably sending some juice there. And I uh, so I would rather launch to a little something, something. If you um, have some books out, but you don't say have a reader magnet yet, you can do a quick and dirty thing. Like you wrote that flipped point of view scene. Um, you could do an extended epilogue. Romance readers love their extended epilogues. I always say on every podcast I go to, I always say they want to know if they got engaged at the end of the book, they want to see the wedding. If they got married at the end of the book, they want to see a baby. They want to see the next baby. They want to see graduations. They want to see golden anniversaries. They want to see them die side by side in the nursing home. Holding, holding hands. hands. Love their people and they have a hard time letting go. So if you're writing romance, just whip out an extended epilogue. It doesn't matter what happened after the story, Christmas, anniversary, a trip out of town. A... In the um, Newsletter Ninja 2 book, actually, uh, I saw, you will have read this, I saw Zoe York on Twitter one day. Um, she was like, here's some ideas for your whatever. And just, it just barfed out like 20 of them. They like, were so good. <laughs> and they were so good. If you want to know how to do something, ask a romance writer. But like, seriously, she just barfed out all of these, like, here's some stuff that happens after the story that you could include. And they were all gold. They are not going to work for your 
post-apocalyptic sci-fi, I guess. But if you're a romance writer, man, go go look at Zoe York. Some of, um, some of them might. It was a good list, though, and it gave, and you had added in some other really good examples, not yeah. just from romance, but also from fantasy mm -hmm. and from um, you know just a police procedurals. One of them I thought was really cool. I, so I'm working with an author named David Putnam, and he is a former cop. Uh, and he writes uh, police procedurals, sort of a like, you know, disgraced cop still trying to save kids kind of a thing. And oh one God. of the ideas that you had in there was genius because, here I'll even tell you what the secret is. Uh, he was a cop for so long and one of the ideas you had was, oh, you could write a case file for the book. And I thought, that is genius. But wouldn't it be cool because Bruno had Bruno Johnson, the main character, he used to be a cop and then he got in trouble and now he's not a cop anymore. It would be really cool to see the case against Bruno. It would. Oh. That would be fantastic. I right? know, right? And I was like, it's like midnight, which is when I finish your book. Midnight, and I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, this great idea. Just like, and so, yes, yeah, so I have you to thank for that. It was, I thought it was like gold. I'm so excited about it. You and because those things you gotta you gotta you know get right on the phone and do it i actually i got up this morning and came out to my computer and there was a, i just had opened a like text file on i have a mac it's just whatever the, the text mm -hmm. thing is uh and i had written down a bunch of ideas for this this other story that i was writing because an article that i read just sort of like synthesized in my head i i think right at bedtime i genuinely don't really remember writing it very much <laughs> I took a bunch of melatonin. Um, <laughs> but so I woke up this morning and I thought, thank God I wrote that down because I don't remember thinking it. So capture your ideas, people. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're not good. Uh, a story I tell a lot is this one time I had an idea while I, I got up to go to the bathroom. Right. Of night, and I, yeah. I wrote my idea down on the fridge because I didn't want to forget it. I was like, holy crap. And when I ran out in the morning to see my amazing idea, it said, someone falls in a hole. <laughs> 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 I, have, wow. I have had that for the same reason, right? Because you're never going to remember that great idea and I've lost too many of them. And so yeah. now I will write that same thing in my notes uh, on my phone. And then sometimes it's not so good. And, and yeah, so sometimes good. it's like fish, bicycle, Cajun spice. And you're just like, okay. Probably not going to work that in, but that's, yeah. fine. that's the price you pay. It's so, right. um, so yeah, that's a, that is a really good idea. For stuff like that, for your police procedurals or uh, anything that has like a cop or a detective or an FBI agent or, you know, any of those kind of people, mm -hmm. you don't generally start the day they like graduate from the police academy or whatever. Right. I, I can't think actually of a series that start. They're always, they've always seen some shit already. Yeah, right. Yeah. So for those people, there's always something in the past you can mine, which is fun because then that's also does a lot of character building for you. Um, right. I think of Lawrence Block's Matt Scudder novels, right? And so Matt Scudder's whole backstory, he too is a disgraced former policeman. He's kind of an unofficial private eye now. And uh, his backstory is that he left the force because he accidentally killed a, a young girl. He was in like a gunfight and there was a ricochet and it killed this girl. Uh, you hear about her in every damn book. <laughs> like, to the point where Lawrence Block is like, I'm sure everybody's sick. of you. Everyone knows now, but I have to still say it every book. But yeah. man, you could write that story. You know, you yeah. could write that event and your readers just are going to have this, they know what's going to happen, but just the mounting sense of horror of watching him just in this like Greek tragedy, just inexorably move towards that moment that you know it's happening. just changes his whole life. It'd be amazing. Um, I'm really into side stories, like the urban fantasy one that you said you downloaded. I'm super into side stories, um, only because I think people do have a tendency sometimes to shoehorn something in that actually doesn't progress, like a lot, but it's really cool. Can you pull it out? If you can pull it out, arguably it doesn't belong there, but it might make a really cool side story, um, which I love. Yeah. Um, I love spinoffs. Spinoffs are great. Uh, it's another place that works really well for romance, especially because romance readers want you to write a story about everybody. You like right. populate your What life. happened to Mackenzie? Did like, she find love? You know, so yeah. story. And I'm like, I'm not, I've gotten to the point where I don't name characters if I don't want to write a story about them because then they won't ask. Like they just psychologically understand. Like they just, just go, okay. It's just a barista. She's not getting a story. Um, <laughs> Which is a bummer because I actually really like Stephen King is amazing at this, just kind of really fully realizing people and then they just mm -hmm. kind of the story because 
your story should be populated by real people. But if you do that with your romance, they all have to have a romance. It's awful. So it's wonderful. What am I talking about? Oh, no, yes. you want me to write books. Um, so I love side stories. I love spinoffs. Uh, the, the epilogue, of course, is always good. It's hard to write an epilogue that works for strangers. I'm mm -hmm. not going to say it can be done because I bet it can. Um, but it's harder. Yeah. Um, it's pretty easy to write a prequel for people who haven't read you. And then it's a very natural sort of progression into the story itself. Obviously, that works pretty well. Um, basically, though, I think that the whole kind of point that I'm making in 22,000 words in the Reader Magnet book is if your Reader Magnet is really tightly aligned with something in your catalog, it becomes what I keep calling a no-brainer. And that's mm -hmm. what I want that no-brainer moment. It becomes a no-brainer that the people who read whatever book want that cookie. And if you've designed it so that strangers can read that cookie, they then want that book or yeah. that series or that world, however it is that you're leading it in. The more tightly like, you can align those things, the better chance you're gonna have. Because if you just give them a standalone story, that's fine. My steamy romance pen name actually has a completely standalone story on the front page of her website because I don't have any way to know where those people came from if someone just types in her name, you know? Right, right. She does have a completely standalone story. It's actually related, but only in a way that I know. Um, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's so much more helpful for you as a writer in terms of building that fan base if you can give them more of what they already want it. want right and I think that's the key for folks is to really give them something that's tightly aligned and I personally just like it to be something short because writing is kind of hard for me and by the time I've slogged my way through 80,000 words I don't want to give it away <laughs> like I just don't want to right. um, I do not want to so well, I would rather write another two or five or even 10,000 words and let that be the giveaway right I, yeah, it's funny because I never have any problems with coming up with giveaways for nonfiction. I always have several in mind. A lot of times I'll think of things as I'm writing, like, ooh, I could add this in. Ooh, I could add this. So it's not uncommon for my nonfiction books to have several different cookies for readers. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I really have struggled with fiction because I did not, A, I don't feel super comfortable in writing a short story. And because it's a completely different skill set than writing novels. And B, I'm the same way, like writing a book is hard and I didn't necessarily want to give away a whole book. And so I love that there were so many little um, ways to do this that do not involve you spending five months creating something to give away. And yet, there were like there are things that have some real value and i love the idea of epilogues and chapters from different characters point of view and you know a million there were you had so many good ideas so you guys should definitely go out and get newsletter ninja 2 because there's no we could be talking for another four hours and still not get through all of the cool stuff in there completely completely amazing i always no matter how many times i go through a book after I hit that publish button, I'll go, oh, you know what I should have done? Blah. So is there a blah moment um, for Newsletter Ninja 2? Wow, that is a great question. Newsletter Ninja 1 and 2 are in stores now, and you definitely want to go ahead and pick those up. In next week's video, part three of my interview with the Newsletter Ninja herself, Tammy Lebrecht, we are gonna be talking about exactly what she wishes that she had uh, put in the book and told us before, and also all sorts of extra little tips to help you push a button and sell a ton more books. So thank you so much for tuning in today. You definitely do not want to miss that interview. You can check it out right here. I'll see you over there.